Wade Boggs not only has a funny nickname and remarkable mustache, throughout his career he cemented himself as one of the all-time greats. If you're an OG of the channel, you would know that back in 2020 I made a video on Wade Boggs. Watch that at your own risk. Let's just say I've gotten a lot better at editing throughout the years. This video was made possible by this comment by frequent viewer Ryan Thompson, so shout out to him for suggesting we do this video today. As always, if you enjoyed the video, make sure to leave a like and consider subscribing. Wade Anthony Boggs was born on June 15, 1958 in Omaha, Nebraska. He was born to Father Wynn, short for Winfield, and Mother Susan, both of whom served in the military. His father Wynn was a Marine during World War II, and his mother was a mail plane pilot. Wade embraced the military family culture and loved the regimented routine every day. This lifestyle would carry over into his baseball career and call it superstition, but Boggs liked doing things at particular times. We'll delve into that rabbit hole later on. Once his father retired from the military in 1967, he moved the family to Tampa, Florida. Wade would eventually begin his high school career in Tampa at Henry B. Plant High School, where he played both baseball and football. After posting a ridiculous 522 batting average as a junior, scouts started to take notice and make more frequent appearances to watch Wade Boggs play. In football, he would change positions, going from quarterback to kicker in order to avoid injury. He was able to make Allstate and get a scholarship offer from the University of South Carolina. Wade Boggs had built up a reputation as a hitter with the tremendous ability to hit the ball. That is, when the pitchers threw him inside the zone. He would find himself struggling to hit the ball outside of the strike zone, and his father Wynn got him The Science of Hitting by Ted Williams. Wade read the book and started to realize that his patience was lacking and took the splendid splinter's advice and forced opposing pitchers to throw him strikes. He found his groove again and would finish the season with a 485 batting average. Even though he had an ability well beyond his years at commanding the strike zone and hitting the ball to all fields, scouts weren't sure if he was big league material. He wasn't exactly a speedster and he was by no means a positively rated defender. Red Sox scout George Digby had to persuade the team to draft Boggs in the seventh round of the 1976 amateur draft. This is what Digby had to say about Wade Boggs. Everyone was looking for the perfect player, and he wasn't a good runner. He didn't have great hands or an outstanding arm, but I liked his bat. I scout bats. I never saw anyone yet that can steal first base. After consulting with his father, Wade decided to take the $7,500 the Red Sox were offering him to sign with their club over playing college ball. In his first taste of pro ball, Wade fared well. He did solid enough to get a quick promotion after playing with rookie season A ball. Boggs started to showcase his ability to put the ball in play and avoid striking out. This would eventually translate to his big league career, and we'll get more into that later on. Slowly but surely, Boggs made all the stops in the minor leagues. After his rookie ball season, he would spend one season in high A, two seasons in double A, and two seasons in triple A, before finally making his first opening day roster. 1982 was Wade Boggs' first season in the bigs, and to say he started strong would be an understatement. He batted a whopping 349 with an 847 OPS, 128 OPS plus. He struck out in just 5.5% of his plate appearances. That is unreal, and it would become a common trend for his career. In fact, his career K percentage was a tick below 7%. How about Ted Williams? 7.2%. Wade Boggs had a better career K percentage than arguably the greatest hitter who ever lived. Wow. Boggs' ability to not only put the ball in play, but to get base hits to all fields is what made him such an unusual offensive force. Wade Boggs was, without a doubt, in the thick of it when it came down to the Rookie of the Year race. In the end, Cal Ripken Jr. took the league by storm and posted the highest war of any rookie, and would take home the award. Boggs would finish third behind Kent Herbeck. Now, if you've seen the movie Toy Story, you probably know that the main villain, Al, is also referred to as the Chicken Man. Well, Wade Boggs was the OG Chicken Man, hearing the nickname after creating an idea for a chicken cookbook with some of his family's best recipes. The idea was sparked by a good friend of Boggs, Brad Green. Boggs cleverly named it Foul Tips, spelled like the bird, of course, and incorporating some baseball terminology to put the cherry on top. The only catch was that according to his friend Brad, the only way to sell this bad boy was to eat chicken every day in an effort to sell it. So starting in 1983, Boggs ate chicken every day and wound up winning the batting title that year. In his own words, so the chicken worked. The superstition continued Boggs' tradition of eating chicken before every game. Now let's expand on just how great the chicken man did in 1983. As we mentioned previously, 
He won the batting title, batting an incredible 361, and also led the league with a 444 on base percentage. He would tally 210 hits, smack 44 doubles, 7 triples, posted a 150 OPS plus, and would strike out just 36 times. Boggs was no power hitter, as he hit just 5 homers, but would drive in a respectable 74 runs. The fact that Boggs could post an OPS well north of 900 despite hitting a mere 5 homers goes to show just how well-rounded he was as a hitter. For his offensive efforts, Boggs earned himself his first Silver Slugger award, and in terms of MVP voting, Boggs got robbed. I should probably make a shirt out of that, because that phrase will be appearing time and time again throughout this video. While Boggs was not better than Cal Ripken, who was an absolute sorcerer at shortstop, Boggs definitely needed to be in the conversation for a top 3 MVP finish. No disrespect to the guys who finished in front of him, but in no universe should reliever Dan Quisenberry and DH Harold Baines have finished in front of Boggs. Bruh. He followed up 1983 with a solid showing. He posted a 125 OPS plus and hit 325. Can you believe that for Wade Boggs, that was a disappointment? Once you understand that, you start to understand the caliber of player we're discussing here. 1985 started Wade Boggs' reign of terror on big league pitching, as if it hadn't started already. He would win his second batting title, hitting 368, led the league in on base percentage, hits, plate appearances, doubles with 42, posted a 151 OPS plus, and finished fourth in MVP voting. This also became Boggs' first season to make the All-Star game, which is incredible considering his 1983 was more than deserving of an All-Star nod. His 240 hits in 1985 were the most in a major league season since 1930. His 368 batting average was a career best and the highest mark by a Red Sox player since Ted Williams hit 388 in 1957. After the 1985 season, Williams was quoted as saying, Boggs is as smart a hitter as I've ever seen. The next five or six years will tell the tale, but if he keeps up like he's going now, he stands to be one of the greatest hitters of all time. This comment would age pretty well, he followed up this season with a 1986 season that was just as fantastic. He earned his third batting title and once again led the league in on-base percentage. He would tally 207 hits, 47 doubles, a league-leading 105 walks compared to just 44 strikeouts, a 157 OPS plus, and won his second Silver Slugger award. In MVP voting, he finished seventh. For the first time in his career, Boggs was afforded the opportunity to play in some October baseball. In a seven-game series, Boggs hit just 233, but the Red Sox would advance to play in the World Series. This fall classic would turn out to be one that would live in infamy, as the Miracle Mets would shockingly defeat the Red Sox after Bill Buckner, hobbled by injuries, made an unfortunate error, and became the scapegoat of an all-time great bullpen collapse. Boggs along the way contributed throughout the seven-game series, hitting 290 and driving in three. Despite the outcome, Boggs was accruing some experience on the game's biggest stage. 1987 was a season in which Wade Boggs took his level of play to a new level. He posted 24 home runs, by far the most in a single season for his career. It's more than double the second highest home run total for a single season in his career. He was intentionally walked a league leading 19 times and would win his third straight batting title, his fourth of his career. A 363 batting average paired up nicely with 89 RBIs, 200 hits, 40 doubles, a league leading 461 on base percentage, 1.049 OPS, and a 174 OPS plus, both of which led the league. Boggs set career highs in just about every offensive category, except for batting average in 1987. He took home his third silver slugger, and in MVP voting, finished ninth. If there was going to be a year where Wade Boggs won the MVP, it should have been 1987, but unfortunately for Boggs, he was robbed yet again. The very least, he should have been top three. Alan Trammell put up a heck of a season in his own right, but Boggs was up there with the game's best. While Boggs' power numbers returned to a semblance of normality in 1988, he continued to be an offensive juggernaut. He won his fifth and final batting title of his career, led the league in walks, doubles, runs, OPS, and intentional walks again, and posted a 168 OPS+, plus, which is not far off from the number he posted a year prior. The Red Sox would face Oakland in the ALCS, and Boggs did his part. He batted 385 and drove in three in four games, but they would fall to the Athletics. This time around, Boggs finished sixth in MVP, and in my opinion, he should have won the MVP this year as well. Boggs had two seasons back-to-back -back that are both MVP campaigns in their own right, yet would go on to finish ninth and sixth. It's lame compensation, but he would in fact win his third straight Silver Slugger award. 
Just to recap that dominant stretch from 1985 to 1988, Wade Boggs won the batting title in four consecutive seasons. He averaged a stunning 364 batting average, 215 hits, a 162 OPS+, 44 doubles, and walked more than twice as much as he struck out. He led the league in on-base percentage every year during this span and would lead the league in OPS two years in a row from 1987 to 1988. Boggs kept his foot on the gas and followed up this awesome stretch with a season in which he won his fourth straight Silver Slugger and said why not lead the league in on-base percentage doubles and runs once again. He tallied 205 hits, marking his seventh consecutive season to 200 hits. His 8.4 war ranked him fourth among position players, yet he finished a laughable 21st in MVP voting. And while he should have been a top five contender, once again, he found himself barely getting MVP consideration. Boggs followed up his 1989 with a down year for him, but still hit 302 and posted a solid 122 OPS+. The Red Sox would make the postseason and match up against the Athletics for the second time in three years. Once again, Boggs did his part in the postseason and batted 438, hitting a home run and posted a 1.125 OPS in four games. 1991 was a return to form for Wade Boggs as he would hit 332, post a 140 OPS plus and win his sixth Silver Slugger. The train unfortunately came off the tracks for Boggs in 1992. He felt slighted by the Red Sox ownership after they refused to extend his contract past a year with an option if he performed well. He lost his legendary focus and would struggle offensively, batting 259 and posting a 96 OPS+. In a shocking move, Boggs would leave Boston to sign with the evil empire, the New York Yankees. Signing with the team's arch nemesis provoked some negativity surrounding his return to Boston. Overall, there were more cheers than boos, and in his return to Fenway, Boggs went 4 for 4, because of course he did. Boggs maintained his legendary focus and would put together a solid season in which he batted 302 in 1993, his first season in New York. He would win his seventh career Silver Slugger. Despite the season being strike shortened in 1994, Boggs would find himself returning to his Red Sox form and batted 342, posting a 142 OPS plus, hitting 11 homers and winning his first career Gold Glove Award. He became the oldest position player to be a first time winner. This year, he won his eighth and final Silver Slugger Award and finished 13th in MVP voting. Boggs followed this season up with a solid campaign, hitting 324 and winning his second and final Gold Glove Award. 1995 was Boggs' first trip to the postseason as a Yankee, and he hit a home run and posted an 890 OPS, but New York would fall to the Seattle Mariners. Boggs in 1996 would put together his 12th consecutive All-Star season, which would be his final year to play in the Midsummer Classic. It was a dreary October for Boggs, as he performed so poorly in the playoffs that he lost playing time. He would post no homers and no RBIs in the ALDS and ALCS. In the World Series, Boggs would walk with the bases loaded in Game 4 to bring in the go-ahead run. The Yankees would eventually go on to win it all against the Atlanta Braves. It took Wade Boggs until his age 38 season, but he finally had a ring. Boggs played just one more season with New York and put together a decent regular season. The highlight was by far his scoreless inning he pitched in his pitching debut. Wade had a solid showing in the ALDS, but the Yankees were an eventual first round exit. The Tampa Bay Rays were a new expansion team following Wade Boggs' final season in New York and he decided to come back home. Remember, Tampa is where Boggs went to high school and created fond memories before starting his professional baseball career. He would put together two respectable seasons in Tampa Bay, batting 280 and 301 in 1998 and 1999 respectively. He decided to hang it up after 1999, but not before adding his name to the historic 3,000 hits club. Two and two is the count. And there's a drive. Deep right field. It is gone. A hit that makes history is a two run home run. Wade Boggs on August 7th in 1989 hit a home run for his 3,000th hit. Go figure that the contact hitter would hit the milestone with a dinger. Boggs had put the finishing touches on a Hall of Fame career. In his first year of eligibility, Boggs received 91.9% of the vote and was elected to the National Baseball Hall of Fame in 2005. Boggs would go on to say that the only time the Hall of Fame entered his mind was when he was rounding first after hitting the home run for his 3,000th hit. He went into the Hall as a Red Sox, for whom he won five batting titles with. Legend has it that Wade Boggs consumed 107 beers while on a cross-country flight all of which he consumed alone. He was known to crush 60 plus beers when traveling across country for east to west coast road trips. 
but the trip in question had guesses ranging from 50 to 70 beers from teammates in those surrounding Boggs' circle. Boggs himself would confirm that the true number was 107. While it definitely would appear like a tall tale, I wouldn't doubt that a superhuman like Boggs had it in him to down 107 beers in one trip. When it came to superstitions, Wade Boggs also had that covered. Here are some of the more notable ones that he followed throughout his career. Every night game, Boggs took batting practice at precisely 5.17 p.m. Wind sprints would take place at exactly 7.17 p.m. He took 150 ground balls exactly for fielding practice. And lastly, Boggs would write the Hebrew word chai, meaning life, in the batter's box before every at bat. From a beer chugging sensation to an all around stud, Boggs is one of the game's most unique when it comes down to it. His ability to be disciplined at the plate and hit the ball to all fields is what lifted him to a career that saw him post a 91.4 war, tally 3,010 hits, and post a career 328 batting average. Wade Boggs is truly a baseball enigma. Let me know in the comments down below your thoughts on the video. If you enjoyed, make sure to leave a like and consider subscribing. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Later.